yesterday was a big celebration called Juneteenth, uh, which is a celebration of us slavery in predominantly in Texas, who had not known about the proclamation of emancipation uh, when it was first noted back in 1863. Some two years later, uh, they were aware that uh, they were freed. So, <clears throat> and that was in the state of Texas in Galveston. So it's a big celebration because men were not made to be captive by another. We are created in the image of God to do life equally. And so that brings me to this question. What is man? Have you ever pondered that question about what is man? That's what we will be talking about today. From the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, uh, chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. But before going there, let us have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for your great mercy. We thank you, Lord God, for who you are. Lord God, I pray that your word go forth with clarity, with power, and with conviction. Father, we dedicate this time to you. We pray, O oh God, as usual, that you may be glorified and we may be edified through the ministering of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, in the book of Hebrews, beginning at chapter 2, the writer writes, beginning at verse 5, Now, it was not angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? or the son of man, that you care for him. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do, not see, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angel, namely Jesus. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through that he might destroy the one who has the power over death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made a, like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become merciful 
and faithful high priest in the service of God to make He himself had suffered when tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. So what is man? That Christ becomes a man. When we think about it, the sovereign Lord became a man like us, like you and I. And the other question is, why should that be important to you? I have three reasons why Christ became a man. And see if you agree with me. The first reason is this, from the passage that we have just read. To represent humanity before God. Christ became a man so that he can represent us before God the Father. 1 Timothy 2.5 says this, There is only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, the man, Christ Jesus. So Christ became a man so that he will be able to represent us before God the Father. Does that make sense? Second reason why God became a man is to be equal with humanity. Just think about it for a minute. The sovereign God in his glory does not know what it is to suffer because who can be compared to him? So how would he be able to speak into your life through the struggles and the heartache that you have if he did not experience life as a human being. It would be very difficult for God to really comprehend what it is like to be strong because in his kingdom there is no struggle. So he became a man so that he can identify with us. It always says you will not know what someone go through until you walk in their footsteps. I can look from the outside and tell you what you should do, but until I walk in your shoes, I will not be able to comprehend what you're dealing with. Moreover, I will not be able to even show much compassion in what you are going through. But when I experience the same thing that you experience, I can have more compassion, more mercy, because I know exactly what you are going through. And so when I say I know, I'm referring to Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ became equal with humanity in terms of identifying with the struggle of humanity. And he experienced that so that, as the scripture said, he can become our great high priest. There is nothing that happens in your world our my world that Christ has not experienced. So he can empathize with our weakness. He can empathize when that happens to one of our loved one and even ourselves, because he experienced that. The scripture said he tasted his death for everyone. So he knows what it is like when life is snuffed out of you. But when you are in Christ, we know that death is not the end. Death is not the end. It's only the beginning. So Christ became a man to conquer death. As the scripture said, that the one who holds the power and keys to death is the devil. God did not create humanity in the beginning. It was not in his plan for humanity to die. He created humanity to have an everlasting relationship with him. But because sin entered into this world, we were separated from the grace of God. But yet he left 
stepped out of heaven to enter into our sinful world to become like one of us. I find that absolutely amazing. We can't strip Christ's divinity away from his humanity because to do that is to make him less than what he is. So God has two nature. Christ has two nature, divine nature and, and the nature of humanity. And they go hand in hand. So Christ became equal with us so he can relate to us in our suffering. He can relate to us in our struggle and he can relate to us in temptation. Because temptation is all around us. Every day, temptation is all around us. If we are honest with ourselves. But more than to deal with temptation, Christ became a man to show us as human beings how we should live in light of who God is. Christ became a man to show us that there is no temptation given to man that we cannot overcome when we look to him. So we see this in Matthew 4, chapter 4. Let me turn to it. Matthew 4, chapter 4. So for those who might say, you know, Jesus Christ could not sin. It was impossible for him to sin. Some people might think that. But I I'm going to say that it is possible that Christ in his humanity could have been tempted to sin. Because if that wasn't the fact, verses at Matthew chapter 4 will make no sense. If Jesus in his humanity could not be tempted to sin. So hear what Jesus says in Matthew 4, verse 4. How we should live. Matthew chapter 4. Am I there? Uh, i got to focus my glasses. It is, but he answered. And that is him speaking to the devil in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil. After being in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry. And the devils tell him to turn the stone into bread. That was a temptation. Now, if that temptation was not real, then all this would not make sense to us. Christ could not identify in what it is to be tempted. So he faced temptation, but he did not succumb to it. Again, he became a man to show us how we should live. And so here is how we should live. He, he, he answered the devil. Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If we. So Christ became a man to show us. That while there is temptation in the world. While we might be tempted in our weakest moment for material thing, we're reminded that the material world is not, is the only thing. He didn't say man shall not live without bread. He said man shall not live by bread alone. He put us in a real world to live, but to live in view of who he is. So when temptation comes, and you feel like doing something that you know you shouldn't, shouldn't do. Remember what Jesus said to, the, to Satan. Man shall not live by bread alone. Our sustenance, our life source is the word of God. The word of God is our life source. And so we chew on it and we meditate on it. In the deepest struggles that ever will happen to you or come to you in life, we look up and we say, God, you are there. You understand exactly what I am going through. And when we live according to the word of God, God in his due time 
will bear us up. And that's what happened to Christ. Because when Christ rebuked Satan by coming back to him with the word of God. After Satan left him, everything Satan tried to do to him. And it was not working because Christ is in, in his humanity. Know that there was a greater source than the material world in which he occupied. So when, he, when the devil tried and did not succeed, the Bible said that Satan left him for a little while. That means he'd be back. So he left him for a little while. But here is the good news. When Satan departed, the Bible tells us that God the Father sent the ministering angel to strengthen Christ, the man. In the same way, when you go through the ups and downs in life, when you feel like you're in a dark spot, there is no dark spot in life that is too dark for Christ to reach. And so he can empathize with you and he will strengthen you and he will bring you through whatever the struggles that you're going through in life. But it is a process. It is a process. It won't happen overnight, but it will happen over time. Sometimes we live in this instant world. I pray, boom, we want things happen. But God said, now wait, my child, wait. I hear you the first time you pray. I did not turn a blind eye to your prayer, but just wait for a little while. Because sometimes you see, it is a struggle that we go through in life that builds us. It's a struggle that we go through in life that we get a better awareness of who we are and who God is in our life. What is your view on why Christ became a man? What is your view? Let me put this another way. How does Christ being fully human affect how you should approach God? How should that make you feel or affect you in your, in your approach to God? John 5, 14 tells us this. This is the confidence that we have in him. Whatever we ask according to his will, we can be sure that he hears us. And we will have whatever it is that we request of him. So how does that make you feel? It should give you confidence. That's what John is saying. It should give you confidence. And the writer of Hebrews, again, agree with John in Hebrews 4, verse 16. One of my favorite scriptures when I'm going through some difficult times in my life. Uh, chapter 4, verse 16. Let us... Then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in, in time of need. Let me read that again. Let us then with fear. Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says, is it? It says, let us with confidence. Why can we have confidence? Because Jesus Christ became a man so he can identify with us. But he is yet divine. So we can approach him with confidence to his throne of grace. And we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Again, this, the, 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 the book of Hebrews, the letters of Hebrew was not written in a perfect time. No, believers were being persecuted. They've been uh, going through some difficult times. And the writer wants to reorientate their, their, his readers thinking, and for us today, to look to God. 
to look to God in every circumstances, in every trials, in every difficulty, because God in Christ became a man to relate and to experience life and to walk alongside you. So whatever it is that's going on in your world today, know that Christ cares about you. Christ loves you. Again, because when you go back to the beginning of verse 2, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? Of course, the writer here is speaking about Christ. But David also asks that same question in Psalms 5. So we can apply this text to our own situation. Who am I that God you sit high but you are concerned about every event, every little thing in my life does not escape your eye. Your eye. So who am I? It's crown on glory. So God cares about you. God's love you. So this is the effect, I believe, that it should have in each one of us in our approach to God. That we can approach God not in fear and trembling, but in humility and in confidence. Know that when we go to God in prayer or we talk to God on the way, whether it's in my car, whether it's your walking, whether it's in uh, taking a shower, you could talk to God just about any place. And so as long as we communicate with him, we can be assured that he takes notice of what our concerns are. In fact, the Bible tells us he knows what we need even before we ask of him. So God sits high, but yet he looks low. He knows your address. He knows what you're going through. So what again, I close with this. Whatever situation that you find yourself in, it is not the hand. You are being made to be stronger. You're being made to be wiser. You're being made to lean more on Jesus Christ. God who became man to identify with you and I. So until then, God bless. I will see you next week. Same time, same place. Take care.